Hey there, I'm Tracy Spears, speaker, author, co-founder of Exceptional Leaders Lab, and head cheerleader for anyone wanting to play bigger. This week, my guest is Dr. Joanne Culberhouse, and I have been so excited about this interview for many reasons that will be revealed during our interview. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Culberhouse's career in education spans 41 years, which doesn't even seem possible knowing how young you are, in various capacities, including teacher, coach, principal, assistant superintendent, retired, though, recently as the superintendent of the La Habra City School District in June of this year. And I want to talk a lot about that. That school district employs some of the most amazing people, Joanne, I have ever met. And I want to unpack that, how you call, how, how that happened. She also earned her doctorate from UCLA, a BS and an MS in education and administration at the University of Nevada, Reno. And in 2018, she was recognized as one of the 100 top influencers of Orange County by the OC Register for her overhaul of the La Habra schools, which I feel like should be a masterclass, by the way, uh, and we'll talk about that. I want to also tell you this, in September of 2018, after 15 months of planning, she and her team completed the restructuring of the district's nine schools, created special focus for each campus, modernized the district's format. And in 2019, received the Superintendent of the Year Award for the ACSA Region 17. Now, listen, there's one more I'm going to read on here, but this resume goes on and on and on. And it's this, <laughs> I didn't know it. In March of 2022, Dr. Culverhouse was selected as the California 29th Senate District's Woman of the Year by Senator Josh Newman. So, how do you, wow, listen, how do you feel listening to the body of work that is you, Dr. Culverhouse? I'm exhausted, Tracy. I'm exhausted. No, you know what? I I love hearing that recap because 41 years went so quickly. And I love the title of this podcast because my whole career was shifting out loud. And there are so many idiosyncrasies that I want to share with you. Uh, a lot of things were just that happened because so much just because of relationships. And I think that's where my success came from with the accolades was because of the relationships. I love that you said, it's not just me that reconfigured the district. It was our team. I mean, I was the puppeteer behind the scenes and, uh, you know, making it work, but it, it's, it's that team and it is all about the relationships, all about relationships. I would say that's your superpower uh, in knowing you now for a few years being able to create those relationships immediately when I met you, I was like, oh, well, we'll be friends forever. And <laughs> uh, I, you know, what, what I didn't know is that, you know, that friendship that started at a, somebody's house at a party one night uh, in, in LA would end up being like a really nice business relationship too. So um, let's, talk, let's unpack that a little bit. But first of all, tell people where you're sitting right now, because I want people to feel like they are kind of getting a glimpse of what's happening. Uh, so, so where are you sitting? So I am sitting in my home in uh, Long Beach, California. And it's interesting, after I retired in June, I, I've only been in uh, this home right now for about uh, two and a half years. And now that I've retired, I have, it's the first time ever that I've spent so much time in this home. And I, I love it. And so it's centrally located. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm on the ocean. And so it is, uh, so I'm in Long Beach, California, which is nice because I have access then into LA um, doing some consulting and some coaching. And so it's all uh, drivable, but uh, just enjoying my time. I, I miss the people. I miss the work of a superintendency. Um, I don't miss the stress and the responsibility that comes a as a superintendent. And so I think right now I'm finally uh, shifting out loud into another, uh, another part of my career. I don't think I've retired. I have not retired. Um, I, I, I'm still working. Uh, and trying to find that balance between play and uh, and consulting and coaching. I talked to somebody yesterday that got super mad when I used the retirement word. And she's like, don't you know, we're not retiring. We're just going on to whatever's next. Like, this is your podcast, Shifting Out Loud. I was like, oh, yeah, I need to start calling it shifting because <laughs> you're right. You're definitely shifting into something else. Before we talk about that, I want to take you back, though, because I am curious, how do you end up being the superintendent at La Habra, was that just on your, you know, I want to be a superintendent of a school system, but let's kind of go back. So as I read through 
you're a, a teacher and a coach and a principal and you were a principal at a, I think of an elementary and then a junior high and then a high school. Like, right. was it, you t tell us a little bit more about your journey. So I became, uh, when I first started teaching, Tracy, I thought I was going to just read, I, I was going to basically die in my classroom. I loved teaching. I taught fourth and fifth grade for 11 years. And I think what a, a, about teaching is that you understand the influence you have over a child. Um, you are a role model. What you say matters, how you act matters, and you can influence a complete generation. Um, I did that for 11 years in, um, as fourth and, and fifth grade. I went back to school, got one master's in uh, physical education and uh, elementary. And I was working with the governor of the state of, Cal uh, state of Nevada at the time and became a lobbyist trying to shift physical education into um, making it mandatory in elementary school and then more of life skills in middle and high school. And because I believe strongly as a teacher, we went out for physical education movement every single day. And I saw that how that impacted a child, a fourth and a fifth grader. It's that, you know, that body image. And that was before a lot of the social media. And I believe so strongly in that movement and wanted to shift it. And then, of course, life moves itself. Uh, went back and got my administrative credentials so that I could uh, move in that area of promoting physical education at the elementary level. And then uh, I was in uh, Reno, Nevada. They have 85 elementary schools in Marshall County. I interviewed to become a principal because I thought, all right, I can do this, but I want to influence larger uh, uh, there are more students and I interviewed and they put you into a pool and so they can match you. So I figure I'd interview. I got in the pool. I'll swim around for a little bit, a little breast stroke, a little side stroke, a couple of butterfly strokes. I'll just hang out in this pool, teach, be happy. Life is good. Life hits uh, that same month. I got into, I uh, got a principalship out at uh, Lois Allen Elementary School outside of its Sparks, Nevada. We were the uh, highest concentration of expellents in the United States. We zoned to five KOA campgrounds and all trailers, 40% uh, of domestic violence. And we tried to go one week without a uh, child protective service. Um, and we never really met that goal. Wow. So seeing the, the dynamic and the importance of, a, of being a leader in a school like that, we, we wrote grants. We got a, um, we had a student who was hit by a car and killed on their way to school, little second grader. We wrote a grant. We got sidewalks in for all the trailers. We got a, a, a rec center put in. I hired a physical education teacher because I could. And, uh, she changed the course of the entire, uh, she changed the course of the entire disc, a school because we, we focused on movement and self-esteem. Did you know when you got that job, were you like, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing? Or when you got it, did you know this is a, this is a heavy lift? Oh, no. I was out to change the world, Tracy. I was in my early 30s. I got this job. I always wanted to be a principal. It's going to influence. I talked to friends that had been in um, education and principalships, and they were like, Joanne, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> like things were happening at that school. And I was young and I, I was confident and it was, I was surrounded by phenomenal people and we were, we were running this school. And then I realized I wanted to get my doctorate. Um, I was actually dating somebody here in Southern California. And so I moved down to Southern California and entered the doctorate program at UCLA. Um, and then you of leave? course you had the left. Okay. The left. And it was, um, it was a difficult it was difficult. It was taking that risk of leaving a comfort zone and coming into an uncomfort zone yeah. and uh, went into UCLA, uh, entered the doctorate program. It's a phenomenal program. Mm -hmm. It is a, uh, a cohort model and it's a, they, they, uh, they always bring in a diverse group. And so like we, you know, I was the very limited white woman in the group. And so you're surrounded by diversity in this program. Uh, I was, and that was in 96. And then I got my doctorate in 98. Okay. So you do that for two years. 
you sit on the sidelines a bit or do you, are you teaching during trying to get that? You, you can't. No, it, it's, it's funny. You know, you look at our, our, our personalities, Tracy, you have a similar personality as mine because I, when you said we met and we immediately hit it off and then I read your book and then I hired you to come in and do work in, in La Habra, but I'm, I'm skipping ahead. But um, I think I thought I was going to be at, at the doctorate program and I still, I still procrastinated on my work and decided I missed uh, the work. I'm not a, I'm not a stay at home student, never have been. Uh, I never was in college. I have so many other activities. And so I then became a principal in Hemet, California, another very low um, socioeconomic high drug use. Um, they have a phenomenal superintendent there now. And I was there for three years and uh, then decided, had an opportunity to come down to Laguna Beach. So I went from the, the uh, you know, in, out in uh, Lois Allen Elementary School into Hemet and then came into Laguna Beach. Oh, right. um, people always say, oh, why'd you leave Hemet? Hemet's a great, it's a great city, but I had an opportunity. I had my, I had my doctorate at the time. Have and you been to Laguna it, Beach? That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you been to Laguna Beach? Why'd you go to Laguna Beach? But Laguna Beach has four schools, two elementary, one middle, one high school. Very fortunate. I was the elementary principal for five years. Uh, had great success there. It's kind of getting a little um, antsy. They were calling me kind of happy feet at the time because I wanted a better, I wanted a, a different challenge at that time. So the superintendent at the time, great mentor, Dr. Teresa Dom, uh, moved me to the middle school. Uh, no middle school experience, um, was a middle school principal for seven years. At, so there's only four schools. And then the uh, principal from the high school uh, moved on to an assistant superintendent, and then they moved me to the high school. So I had a, I, I should have taken notes because I had the same group of kids from kindergarten all the way up to uh, graduating from high school. Nice. Oh, I love that. I love the idea there's a bunch of people running around that had you in that seat for their entire uh, experience of being in, uh, in pre pre through twelve pre K through twelve. Yeah, they had a they yeah. had a speaker by retirement. If you call it retirement, my 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 party that had had me as their princess Leanne Hayon, who's now a teacher, had me as an elementary, middle, and a high school pr uh, principal. With my name's on her diploma now, so it's pretty 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 uh, pretty. Yeah, it's just it's just an honor. It's an honor. So I I do I know we'll jump around a bit, but when you. Yep. The shift that um, to La Habra, I obviously I want to talk about that. Uh, I'm it's, I, I'm so blown away by my experience when you did bring me in. Thank you for that, by the way. And um, the people that you that you introduced me to, and I remember I'll never forget a couple of things. One is you driving me to the school and pulling over and saying and calling the crossing guard by name. <laughs> that I didn't I watched you Joanne move around in a way that I thought um, you should be teaching leadership courses because I can't think of anything that you weren't the any box you weren't checking about you know how to curate a culture how to uh, you know uh, mobilize an entire organization and so yeah. I want to start there and ask you this you get that job, and if there's a story you want to tell us there, but did you make a decision what kind of leader you wanted to be, or was it just a kind of a continuation from who you were in other jobs? But what what was that process when you decide to go to La Habra? You know, Tracy, that's a, a great question. And just, I was in Laguna Beach for 15 years, and I knew that I was becoming stagnant in, 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 this, in this, it was a great, great experience. I took a uh, a $30,000 cut to leave Laguna and go be an assistant superintendent in Palos Verdes because I knew that I had to, I, I had to run. So I'm going to get to your answer. I'm going to answer your question, but um, I was able to be an assistant superintendent of education services and then of, of HR. So what got me into to La Habra, uh, it was the intentional I was very intentional of watching other leaders that I'm surrounded by my, my whole career. Like I would watch uh, individuals that were my superintendents and the other assistant superintendents. And I'm, and I'm kind of thinking, wow, I want to, I want to be that. 
it, but it, it, I want to be this. I, I want to make people feel the way other leaders made me feel. Yeah. And I think it goes back to that relationship. Um, I had a principal when I was a teacher, Rich Marcucci. And the, the best thing I can say when I learned, but that's when I started watching leaders and I was watching Rich. And I was a teacher with a lot of energy. I had a lot of ideas. And every time I would go to him, he'd go like, oh, Joanne. You know, I, I wanted to, you know, take the kids on field trips. I wanted to do a camp out. I want to do a sleepover. And every time I went to him, I thought I was the most important person in the room. And when I became a principal and then moved my way up and we, we still maintain a relationship, I said to him, I always felt like I was the most important person in the room. And he said to me, are you kidding me? You drove me nuts. Like, <laughs> you I'd see you come in and I'd try to figure out if I could just go another direction because I knew that you were going to have something you were going to say or you were going to have an idea. So that stuck with me, Tracy. And I thought, I want to be that rich Marcucci. I want to be the person that no matter what, my hair is on fire, everything is crazy around me, but I want that person that I'm talking to to know that they are the most important person in my day at that time. And I think I, I, I you do it with kids. Um, you can do it in any profession in business. You can do it in. So there's that leadership is making people feel like they are heard and you know them by name, by face and by story. I want to exclamation point that I want to. I want to also label it presence. You know, a lot of times people hear the term executive presence and they think, well, I'm not the president. I'm not a CEO. That doesn't matter. But let's just remove executive and let's just call it presence in general, right? Like the, the definition is to be present. Like it's right. just, it, but, and yet I do think it's a muscle because I think you can learn it. I think exactly. there are, I've watched people in the past that have been terrible at it, make a couple of decisions. And those decisions aren't hard ones. It's look somebody in the eye. Don't talk. Don't look at your technology. Ask a good follow-up question. So like right. getting into this thinking, that's something I need to be better at. Be better at it. Start it. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that I knew, when you asked the question of being intentional, when I, when I arrived in La Habra, La Habra is, uh, was, we were 83% Spanish-speaking families. And so that I knew that I had a reputation of coming from Laguna Beach and coming from Palos Verdes, and I needed to connect with that, not just that school, but that community. Mm -hmm. So the old, you know, the old adage of a hundred meeting, you know, a hundred people in a hundred days. And I, I took that seriously, man, I went at it. Uh, you know, I went at it. I'm, you know, a hundred plus people in 95 days, but this is one thing that I did is after I told my story so people could relate that I was in other positions besides the higher socioeconomic areas. And you can, you can translate this as a business CEO as well. I told my story and then I handed out cards and I had everybody write down like their experience, you know, how many years I've been in the district. And then I had them turn it over and I had them write me what connected them to me as a, uh, as a person. Like what part of my story? My dad was in the Air Force. My mom was a drill instructor. I, I was an athlete in um, all through college. Uh, like teachers would write things like, you know, my, my daughter played volleyball. I played volleyball. Um, I lived in Reno. I had a cousin in Reno. And so your story, if you can tease out from people the connection that they have to your story, and then I had those cards. And every time I would go to a school, I'd sit in my car for five minutes, have a little extra sip of a, of, a, of a latte, and I would memorize those cards. And I would go into the school, and if I didn't know the name, I would uh, get a yearbook, get a class, get the, get the staff photo, and I would memorize names and how that person attached themselves to me. And, that's, and then you, you go into that teacher's room and you ask about their daughter who plays volleyball, or you it's, it's, it's such an easy thing to do, but it has to be intentional. It doesn't come, it just, you don't just wake up and say, oh, I'm going to memorize everybody's name. You have to be intentional about it. The fact that you make that decision and yet a lot of people make that decision, but don't do what you just said, take the time to execute that decision. Right. Like we all want to be 
the person that remembers all of that stuff, but you didn't leave that to chance either. You figured out how to create a system so that the system can support your intentions. I think a lot of people don't create systems to import to Correct. support your intentions. They just have all these great intentions that never happen. So that's that go deeper piece that you know, that makes you sitting where you are and amazingly successful, that the system is what will support that in a way that you can execute on it. So you did two things. You created the intention, you created a system, and then take me from there. So what, what else was on your list of things that you wanted to, that you're in, what were your intentions in, in that? The, the intention was like the, when you mentioned the reconfiguration and bringing you in my second year, we brought you in. We did a, uh, cause we did a book study every year. And uh, my first book was, or what the book was called uh, Boys in the Boat, because I needed to relate to all of the male and female leaders in the district. And it c couldn't be a big, heady book. I mean, it's a heady book. It's about 1936, the, uh, the team, this little team up in Washington that, that wins the Olympics. They had no business winning the Olympics, no business winning the Olympics. They were, um, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the infrastructure but they had the grit and they had the gut. So that was our first book. And we talked about rowing in the same direction. And then we brought your book in that, and you came in and started going down a little deeper and talking about, and then the personalities. And the other thing, part of what you did, and then I brought you in, as you remember, to be a keynote is to be, it, 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 you start small. You have to start small and then you go, you go wider. And the, what was intentional about coming in is I'd had to empower the other leaders because as a superintendent, if you don't empower other leaders and surround yourself by smarter people, um, and you, you always hear that you surround yourself as a leader. I had a team of seven people that helped run that district. I had a team of seven people and then an entire uh, task force that allowed us to move and shift a 45 year old system that was not good for kids. Um, we had, uh, we had four schools that were transitional kindergarten through second. We had three schools that were third, fourth, and fifth. And we had two schools that were sixth, seventh, and eighth. And that worked well for 45 years because they had to do that to equalize the, um, back there, there was an assembly bill that said you could not have a, a 15% discrepancy between minority students. So. It was a system that had been in place. People have been talking about it for years. I came in and thought, ah, this, this, this is too big. Like this, this is too big. We, we work, I wasn't going to do anything with this. Then you get in there, you write reconfiguration on your whiteboard. I tell you, if there's a leader out there listening that doesn't have a whiteboard or two or three or five or six in their office, that's right. take down those pictures, take down those um, inspirational quotes, and you slap up a nice, clean glass whiteboard. And that's how you build leadership in your team. Well, and I'll let, let's go a little deeper. The first time I went into your office, I saw the big whiteboards. I share that passion with you. And the idea, you know, that your people walked into that meeting, they all had their own marker, they could all write on the, you know, like yeah. and everybody was part of. Right conversation you facilitated that in a way that says to people i care deeply about what we think and i don't care uh -huh. about what i think like i don't know I, you said that in a way however that that day that as an observer to uh watching how i'm gonna say uh involved mm -hmm. the, like your people were all in and i don't see mm -hmm. that often i'm not mm -hmm. gonna that. so well done yeah Rick. Well, and I think, yeah, and this goes back when we first started talking about relationships. I'm just going to tell you very quickly. So you have a system that's 45 years old. I wrote reconfiguration on the whiteboard in my office. And as people were coming in, community people, the mayor, council member, city, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking about this reconfiguration. And people just kind of, that's ah, it's just what we did. It's just the way it is. You know, so when you say you're from La Habra, you name three schools. I went to this school, this school, this school. Because, so you got parents that are dropping off. Elementary, three through five, six, eight. You've got PTAs that are divided. You've got kids that are leaving a location at second grade. They should be going through so that when they're a fifth grader, they can go back and help out in the kindergarten teacher's classroom 
in the first grade, they, that, that builds that connection to school. But the kids left in second grade and then they never, they never went back. So um, going back to the reconfiguration, wrote reconfiguration on the board. And then after I got there in January 2017, when people started getting excited about this reconfiguration. So I started looking at who would be the, on this task force. Didn't put out an application. I kind of handpicked because I was asking other people, who are the leaders, who are the influencers, who are the people that have the same grit and the same tenacity that our cabinet had and getting things moved. And we put together a task force. I'll never forget it on May 7th, brought in these individuals. I put somebody else in charge of the task force, who is now the superintendent who's, who took my place after all this time, Dr. Mario Carlos. Um, we worked all summer. Um, and then the board approved our plan in November. We moved 128 teachers the following year. We changed boundaries. We changed bus routes. We changed special ed programs. And within 15 months, we have, and it still exists, a TK6 uh, format at every school has a magnet focus, one being international baccalaureate for the primary year program, and one being uh, the middle school now is an international baccalaureate middle year program. That's, that's sustainable. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Another 45, 50 years, you know, what do you, what do you, so that's a lot of change for a lot of people. I'm sure there were bumps in the road. As you look at that plan and how you laid it out, unpack for me a bit. What were some of the things you did to ensure and lead people through change? Was there a, a framework that you worked from? Uh, from the neck up, my yeah. head, uh, my team, the relationships. Uh, we, there was no framework work because it had never been done before. And I looked deep into other districts that had, I visited a couple of districts that had done major reconfiguration, but nothing to the extent of what we were trying to do. So no matter if I would go out and visit, I wouldn't see the connection between our reconfiguration. So we as a team had to, put our heads together and write and get it all written out. Like there were some times like shoes in the corner, pizza boxes on the table, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. And we, we were grinding getting this done. And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Um, but I'll, I, I have to tell you the, um, the one thing, and my mentor who was a, Kent Beckler has been a, um, a, perfect role model in, in, in my career, but he ta tried to talk me out of this. He said, that's too much change. For, you will, you're going to go down. I can't, and you're you're going to go down. Too much change. You got you, you to gotta slow this down. And I didn't because it was good for kids. But what we did do, I think it was a tipping point in shifting is in you became, you were the uh, keynote speaker at our second back to school breakfast. So you can experience and talk to the energy in that room. The first time the district had usually put classified like the, the office managers and the custodians and main, you know, they were all the classified employees and certificate employees and they would always keep them separate. We brought them together. So it was the first time that I was able to address these this incredible school district, right? We put them all in the same room. So Kent Beckler, I had the speech ready and it was all going to be about the reconfiguration, good for kids, my goals, my objectives. I was going to, and I, I was worked hours and days on this and man, I was going to get up there and I was going to smash it. He said, you're not using any of that. Like, just throw that away. And this was the day before. And I'm like, wait, what? And he said, nothing in that speech tells the people that are following you who you are like nothing there's nothing in there that says who you are so i'm like oh my gosh it's up hours early in the morning and what i did is i shifted and the the ship was all about my dad and how my dad so i can't stand up there as leaders you it's hard to stand up there and say to people i'm honest I'm ethical, I'm, I'm this and this and this. But when you can say you were raised by a man who lived his life 80 plus years at the honest, integrity, 
then you're raised by that and you share stories about this man who is in a memory care now and suffering from dementia, but I was able to share with them my, and I got emotional in front of all these people and I connected. Everybody had a story about their, not just their dad, because you're not all people aren't raised by their dads all the time. They're not raised by their moms. We got to get out of that habit in education. You are raised by an, another adult that is doing, you know, that's raising you to the best of their, uh, of their ability. And then what happened is my dad passed away a month later. So after the speech, I got cards and letters and emails and connection, connection, connection. Cause my dad and my dad, my dad passes a month later. We are in the middle of this reconfiguration and it allowed me to get out of the reconfiguration and get back off of the details and know who was moving here and what was going to be having here, what bus route was here. And it allowed me to reconnect. And so it, it was a, it was a life altering experience for me. I miss my dad every day, but it, it shifted. Sure. Oh yeah. my gosh. I, I do. Thank you for telling us that. And I do remember that just when you stood up there, you're very good to be I don't know, so intentional about the connector piece, yet it's intuitively who you are. But I do remember thinking, oh, that's why these people will run through Wall Street, because they couldn't give two shits about your plan, right? They, they trust, like confidence at your level is implied. Everybody in the room is like, she must be smart. She wouldn't have the job, right? <laughs> As we know, there are probably a few statistically people that shouldn't be in those big jobs, but you or definitely should be in that job. And so I think most people uh, that stand up there on that stage, their instinct is, I need to prove that I should be here. And so let me tell you right. how smart I am. And let yeah. me tell you my plan and all that, which is exactly the opposite of what people, right. it creates a bigger gap between mm -hmm. them and the person that's leading. And you lean into that, you know, whoever mm -hmm. whispers that in your ear completely erases that gap that defines leadership, I think, which is the leader that is uh, more vulnerable and connecting on a level that says, I got you, right? I care deeply about you. Let me tell you what my personal value system is mm -hmm. and why. So I, I did watch that day. Um, and I, I you all handed out buckets, if I remember correctly. I yeah, because the theme was the fill, fill your bucket. And we had buckets. Yeah. Yep. It was, yeah. yeah. But you did a, a lot of things that I don't think a lot of leaders do is you created community, not just with them, you person with you personally, but you gave them some things to identify to, like the diamond, the mm -hmm. like swag mm -hmm. that everybody was wearing. Everybody, you know, you could just tell they were connected on the bigger the bigger piece of that. So it was that intentional too. Like we've got to sell this, we've got to what, what it did you do was, it was, yes, it was, it was intentional. It was, uh, with, but not just me, it was with the team, you know, it was with the team. We're sitting down. What are we going to do? Uh, the first year was, uh, had Jeff Eben come in, uh, how many wins have you had? That was our theme. Uh, the second theme, that thing that, uh, was, uh, how many, uh, excuse me, fill in your bucket. But I think, I don't think you're going to remember this, but here's the other thing that is intentional that leaders miss an opportunity to also tell people who they are without telling people who they are. And I don't know if you remember this, but when I introduced you, uh, Rose was with you, your wife was with you. Mm -hmm. And I intentionally introduced you and I called out Rose. I had her stand up, I introduced her, she stood up and I introduced her as your wife and that was it. Like that was another key shift in that district that I was able to introduce you and your and your wife was there to support you on that day. That was huge. You know, thank you for saying that. And uh, she never goes with me anymore. However, she's such a huge fan of yours. If I'm ever speaking anywhere you are, she's you know. <laughs> But, but that was also a shift for me, right? So I'm new to the, uh, you know, being authentic. I want to talk about DEI and inclusivity and all that, but I still get 
knees knocking when people mm-hmm. find out about my story and right. that, 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 that was so such a non-event gets filed away for me as nobody cares. Like, you know, it, 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 it was a non-event, but, but there was a little bit more for you in that because there was things that people were learning about, you know, each other and what they wanted to be. What happened for you in the next, in the next meeting? Can we talk about it? Yeah, we can talk about it. So I go and I spend um, five years now. So I brought you in as a keynote speaker, brought in different keynote speakers over the time. We always had a book that we were reading, a uh, huge fan of Simon Sinek, huge fan of Margaret Wheatley. Um, so always having a, a, a book that we were, um, Charles Mackesy, the new, the boy, the horse, the mole. And uh, we did that as, as, as a book club because everybody was in so uh, overwhelmed with COVID that they, they just needed something to feel good about and to relate. But we always related it back to leadership. So then what happened? So I'm there for um, some G- uh, January of 17. Um, and then I do that speech. My past, my dad passes away. We bring you in. We bring, so we've had multiple. And now remember we had COVID, so we didn't do it for two years. Right. But then the last in August, and this is before I knew I was going to retire. So August, uh, August of this year. So August of 2021, before I retired, not this year, the year before. So I'm, 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 I'm jumping, yep. but I'm trying to get you to, uh, to what that, the context. So it's the, it's the first year back from COVID. And I think any organization that doesn't talk about and recognize the impact that COVID had on all of us and your story and my story and kids' story and family stories and the death and the, the sickness and the sadness and, and the isolation, uh, we, we're, we're missing an opportunity if we don't talk about it because it was a, a horrendous time for, our, for, our entire, for the entire world. So now... We have two years of COVID. We're coming in on in August of 2021. I have not announced my retirement because I didn't know I was going to retire, and it's in August. So we're going to hit diversity, equity, inclusion, social and emotional well-being, and that is something that we are going to really work on. So my uh, board member, who is a, an amazing human being, Adam Rogers, I first met him when it was my first year there, and he introduces himself and his husband who's a teacher in a local district and their two boys. So Adam introduces me to his husband and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And then Adam then uh, becomes my board president. So through Adam's openness, I am able to be open with who I am as a, as a lesbian leader. Now I can say that to you in a podcast now and not feel like I'm going to throw up. Right. Because I have... Uh, I, I've, I've come to that, you yeah. know, and it, it took me 41, 40 years, Tracy, to get to, um, to a point where I was with my cabinet, my third year in, and we were doing a retreat at my house and, um, we were talking about often Brene Brown stuff, authenticity, and, and everybody went around the room and I didn't share my sexuality because I don't think it's, it's not coming out. It doesn't, Anyway, at that time. Yeah. And then we're all finishing up. And I just said to myself, I sat everybody back down. I go, I need, we need to sit down. We need to talk. And I shared my story about um, growing up uh, in a household that didn't accept my uh, bisexuality, a mother who loved me but didn't know how. My dad, of course, accepted, you know, uh, accepted very easily. My mom not uh, recommending, um, uh, shock therapy when I was in high school and never really accepting it. Um, so I went through fear that I was going to lose my job for being gay. Of course. Uh, my whole career, 40 years, 40 years, never, never talked about it. It was just, in my opinion, nobody's business, you know, never wanted to be the gay superintendent. I never wanted to be the gay principal, the gay. I just, I, I didn't want to, I wanted to be the superintendent. But what happened, and there's no but, but with my cabinet, after that day, we became closer. Like mm-hmm. we were, we were unstoppable now because the vulnerability that I shared. So coming back down to August of last year, I asked Adam to share his story. And I say, Adam, can you, 
share your story about being um, a gay young man going through school and what you went through and the teasing and the bullying and then to where you are now, a board president, uh, very vocal with two boys in our district. So he's like, oh, sure, Joanne, I'll share the most vulnerable part of my life with you. <laughs> right? <laughs> so he gets up there, Tracy, and he yells it. He talked about the second grade teacher that used the, that overheard kids in the class calling, using the word faggot. And she stopped everybody and she brought them all in the carpet. He didn't know what it was, but he knew that was like a bad word. And the kids started, and she, this was a long time ago, right? Sure, sure. So, so he talked about the bus driver who in middle school has got teased and teased. And she said, and Miss Katie said, um, it's not always going to be that way, Adam. It's not always going to be that way. Or the social study teacher in high school who was a football coach and an ex-Marine who overheard kids calling him gay. And man, we would have thought that he brought the roof down on these kids. Nice. So Adam is sharing his story to all of these educators, maintenance workers, office managers, all the entire district. Could have heard a pin drop. Sure. So it was standing ovation, tears in the audience. But he was saying as a gay parent, you have to walk into a room and figure out who your foes are, who your friends are, who your folks. And, and I, I have done that my whole career. You, you kind of come in and you, you and you're gauging, right? Um, so what happened is that I was going to stand up there and I had my script and I was going to talk about the murder of George Floyd, the unprovoked attacks on the, um, Asian American population. And I stood up there and I had the mic and I said, Adam, thank you for sharing your story because Adam's story is my story. Oh. And I you didn't I know like, you were going to do that. You did no, not know you were going to do that. Not even a thought. Like when he was sharing his speech with me, I'm like, no, there's no way. Right. So the table of the cabinet that knows me really well, they're like, do we pop a balloon? Do we pull down the tent? Do we upper, I mean, what do we do? Because I'm standing and saying nothing. They told me that I turned my back to the group. I don't remember turning my back to the group. Oh, that's an out-of-body moment for sure. So I turn back around. I take my script. I turn my script over. I come out from behind the podium and I tell my story. Wow. Uh, off script. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting emotional even just uh, thinking about that, um, about that time. Um, do you feel like you're at risk? Do you feel like this is a big risk for you? Because Adam is not the superintendent. Yep. yep. The risk was not my, I, I didn't think about the risk. You know, I mean, I, I, I didn't think about the risk at that time. I just said it. And then I knew I had to follow up with it. Okay. And I was able to talk about how um, I, my ex-partner had, uh, had, a, had a child and I came into his life when he was young and I became his other parent. I was talk, able to say that when he, um, the worst day in the, our household was on Father's Day because he would come home, didn't have a, he was artificially inseminated, didn't have a dad. So when you say to kids, mom and dad, Adam's boys don't have a mom, it was all about diversity, equity, inclusion. I talk about how a fear of losing my job. I talk about um, fear of the community, fear, the fear that I had as a gay leader coming up with fear, but yet those little things, now that I'm reflecting in it on a live podcast here, um, like when I said, you know, introduce Rose, that was a, that was a step. When I talked about Adam, I always say his, his, um, his husband and what it did, Tracy, it turned that district in, it, it turned the district with Adam's story and my story. Um, I had a, you know, I, I, I can't even explain to you what it did. Uh, both middle schools right now have a gay straight alliance at the school, a GS, uh, gay straight alliance. Uh, I would walk, it was exhausting because everybody wanted to share their story with me that they have an <laughs> alpha yeah. or a kid who could possibly be trans. And um, I would walk into classrooms and I would see marriage pictures, same sex marriage pictures on the desk, uh, the band teachers saying how proud he was because he buried his husband that summer and he was bawling. I was bawling. Uh, oh, it God. was exhausting for so long because everybody wanted to talk about it. But, you know, I, I, I have to say, though, that when I first got there, I have a picture of Nicholas in my office 
and the union president, who is uh, a, just a phenomenal person. Um, and she asked, like when I first got there, a couple months, uh, about the dad, if there's a dad involved. And I said, no, I have my ex, artificial insemination, I put his life. And she said, oh, okay. And That's it. nothing. When I basically gave this speech um, that her, her teammates at her school were asking her, oh my gosh, did you know? And she's like, yeah, but and why did you tell us? And he says, she says, not my story to tell. Mm -hmm. So five years as a union president, she and I have this amazing friendship and relationship. And yet it, it showed me that it was not an issue. That's right. That's a lot of talking on my part, but I, I, I wanted to share that because I know that you were familiar, but it was a big deal in the district. Oh my gosh. There's so many people gay or straight. It doesn't matter when you reveal a part of yourself, like, and, and we all have them, whatever it is, when you reveal that in a way that says something so much deeper. And yet most people that are not battling that they reveal something and it's not a big, this, you could, you could be, you could lose your job or you, yeah, could, like, you could, there's, there are so many consequences to that. And the political climate right now, like I was feeling really good a couple of years ago. I'm back to right. being censored a bit. And, and yet I know that, that is, I have to stay true and right. I'll, I'll tell my story, but it, it, my fear has gone up. I'm still yep. telling my story, but my fear has actually gone up a bit. Yep. And I hate that about our political climate. I remember getting a text from you. I don't know if you remember sending it to me. And you said, uh, hey, hope you're you're well. I just came out to my entire school district. Uh, hope you guys have a good weekend. And I called <laughs> you. I was like, what? I <laughs> yeah, it was so, I mean, I knew how big it was. And I'm so proud of you for doing that because for so many reasons, but there's so many people in that room. When you say, and immediately the school was changed. I want to contextualize that for everybody. The minute everyone he hears somebody's story, then it gives them permission to feel their own and to live their own. And that's the point, right? The, the inclusion work that I know we do a lot of is you just have to hear people's story because once you hear it and connect with them at that deeper level, I mean, that's what psychological safety is. Everybody, every organization is trying to get it. I, you know, you and I were raised, check your shit at the door. Nobody cares yep. about what you do in your private life. Nobody yep. cares if you're mad or whatever. And that's just not the climate today. The pandemic yeah. erased whatever was left of that. Like we right. have to be able to walk into whatever room we're in and wholly authentically be who we are. And that's not easy to do. And I just want to say they are so lucky that they had a leader right. that modeled that. Thank and you. So, of course. And I know we're, we're getting down to, uh, uh, but I don't want to cut this short. So I want to ask you a follow-up question to that. August, you're, oh my gosh, things are going great. And then like the next text I get, oh yeah, I'm retiring. What happened? I haven't even asked you. You know, that was in August. Um, I had had multiple uh, conversations and reflections and meditation on my, on my own uh, and trying to just look at my career and look at the impact that we as a team had in La Habra. And I felt like getting us through the reconfiguration was one, was, was two, two years. Getting us through COVID was another. And I just felt that it was time for me to experience another journey for myself. Like I, I didn't leave because I was unhappy. The board that I have what was uh, un unbelievably supportive. Um, and the board was, um, I told them, I ended up deciding in December that I was going to. So it was like August and one uh, principal teased me. She said, oh, so you have your big coming out and then you decide to, you know, get out of Dodge, right? And I said, no, I was, wasn't thinking of that when I, when I did that in August. It was, I know that in my, I've always known when it's time to make a, a, a shift. Okay. That's why this podcast title is so good. I feel like I've always had an intuitive understanding when I needed to make a shift. I knew I needed to leave Laguna Beach to be an assistant superintendent. And I knew when I was an assistant superintendent, it was time for me then to make a shift. And I started looking for superintendencies. 
And I, it was the same exact feeling of my entire career, leaving Reno, starting my doctorate. It's just something that I, I, I knew it was time for another journey. Mm-hmm. And I knew it was also time for another, another leader to come in. And the board chose wisely, and they selected uh, Mario, Dr. Mario Carlos. So the, the district's 125 years old. They've had five superintendents, and this is the first male Hispanic superintendent that the district has ever had. Uh, and so the decision was not taken lightly. Um, multiple conversations with the, my board president at the time, who would happen to be Adam Rogers, um, very very well thought of, and I talked it through with him, and then I was able to talk it through with my other with my other board members as well. I, it just it was just time. Okay. And now that I've made that decision, I, I feel like every career, every shift I've made, Tracy, it's it's um, influenced a larger body. And now that I'm retired, I am now coaching and consulting, and I feel like I'm working now with future leaders that have the potential to be authentic and vulnerable and lead yet another group. It's, it's just a continuum. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. So you shift away from being in one institution and to grow your influence. So if somebody, who would be someone that you would be coaching now? Like what would be an example of that? So I'm working through the, the actually the organization Leadership and Associates that, um, that recruited me for, for La Habra. It's called Leadership and Associates. Um, I'm working with what's called a superintendent leadership uh, series. So superintendents in one, one region, uh, assistant superintendents in another region. But then I would have one-on-ones with assistant superintendents, principals, deputy superintendents, and the, the, the district chooses the contract with Leadership and Associates. And then I come in and they match me to a person with my personality, my experience. So I have, um, I have 10 individual soon to be that, that are working on leadership. That I'm coaching and I'm talking to them and I'm reviewing how they're handling things and talking to them about their challenges. And then I'm one-on-one coaching another superintendent. It's just, uh, just he, he and I are working together for this next year. It'll start in December. Nice. So I feel like there's a there's a a way to take all the experience that that um, that I've had in in my career to now pay it forward. So I feel like that's what I'm doing right now. I'm not I'm not in the in the minutia of the everyday leading a district uh, and the systems and the people. And I loved what I did, but I feel like I'm broadening to a larger um, a, a larger sphere of uh, influence to get the super leadership from people that are looking at becoming superintendents, looking at moving up the ladder into more of an influence because bottom line, kids benefit. Yeah. When you put a, when you put a leader in these positions and superintendent, you, you have power over processes for kids. Yeah. And that's, that's my next step. Listen, when I, the Dr. Carlos, by the way, uh, May Z and Shout yep. out to you and congratulations. Yes. The fact that he was ready to step into that is also another function of a, uh, of a leader. Like you were intentional about making sure people, your succession plan, and because you even mm-hmm. said something to me pretty early on about making sure people are ready whenever you're. Right. So maybe you didn't know you were thinking about that, but I remember thinking that, oh, wow. So, you know, most people get the job. Right. I, I saw the joy on your face. I saw. Uh, I don't know, 500 people in a room. I don't know how many people were in that room, but I, I left there so uh, impressed, excited for not yeah. only you, but for the, for that entire school district. And so, yeah. no, having that experience and then thinking about whatever is next, most people would just stay there, uh, but yeah. you, to keep, keep on going. I love that you are listening to that voice. Well, I didn't know, like when, I, when just to, for, for clarity, I, I was working on a succession plan when I got there. I mean, I knew that I was not going, to, that I was going to be there. I told the board I would be there five to six years. So in my mind, and I think when, we, when you and I talked about it, I didn't know when I was going to, to be leaving, but I always knew I was never going to leave to go to another place. But I started looking at like Dr. Carlos and his ability and moved him to a director, then to an associate superintendent, knowing, and then moving pieces around 
and giving people the training that they needed, not knowing when, and then just decided after the coming out story, it was time. Well, not because I didn't retire yeah. because of that. I don't want to, yeah, you know, mislead, but it was it was just time. Those two things are not related. Was it no. cured when? Uh, so I follow Dr. Carlos on Twitter, so I love watching all the stuff they have going on. I thought about you when school started back. Was it was it hard and weird for you, or was it like, oh my gosh, it was no. so exciting, hard, hard and weird. It was so hard. But I have to tell you, um, I the day of the breakfast because it's only a year later now, right? So I'm in Orcas Island with some friends and uh, it's the day of the breakfast and I am wake up, I'm feeling sad. I'm just feeling sad and um, missing out, like the FOMO, fear of missing out, you sure. know? And I got a call from this amazing teacher, Gloria Ross, who uh, she was an inspiration every time I walked on that campus. And unfortunately, she her cancer had come back. So she has been battling the, the, the cancer. And she was not at the breakfast uh, because she's what needed to take time off to take care of her health. So I walk on the beach and feeling sorry for myself. And my phone rings. And it's Gloria Russ. So she's crying. I'm crying. We're talking about how it's not just a breakfast. She is like, I... And I said to her, I, you needed to call me because we needed, we talked for like 45 minutes. We laughed about things that have happened in the past, but we decided, and she said it right. She said, it's a, it's a family reunion. That breakfast that you experienced, it's a family reunion when people are coming back. So after I hung up the phone with her, I'm crying, she's crying. I'm feeling sorry for myself because I'm not there. She can't be there because she's battling major health issues. And we needed each other. We needed each other. And I, I, I love her to this day. I communicate with her. She is a, she's a hero in my world because she's so high energy and so good for kids. Mm. Mm. Well, listen, I could talk to you all day and uh, we, w we will talk again soon. It, I will, everything that I have, gleaned from your shift into uh we're not calling it retirement anymore i got spoken to you many times trying to get this even book and you couldn't do it because you're in orcas island or you're on vacation <laughs> somewhere or you're on an island somewhere so no, you're doing this shift beautifully friend uh is what what's the thing you're most looking forward to like what's next for you like that's that's the thing or have you gotten there yet um, the next thing I'm looking forward to is uh, is what I'm doing right now is to not be tethered to my calendar as much. Um, I, I drove up and spent time with my sister. I have one sister. We're a small family. She doesn't have, I don't have nieces and nephews. I have friends. And I was able to put my Sphinx cat in the car and drive for two and a half weeks, you know, up to Reno, Nevada, Carson City, and spend two and a half weeks with my sister. So what I'm looking forward to is I'm going back up there over Christmas and probably spending two and a half or three weeks. And it's just that time that I could never spend with her and, uh, and coming out to uh, Tulsa too. Listen, bring Goose with you. Uh, we'll, in, in, the, in the show notes, <laughs> I'm going to try to put a picture of that cat. I had never, uh, didn't know those cats existed. Uh, uh -huh. it, it has, it's a hairless cat. Super the hairless cat. Yes. And I will. I and your and your wife fell in love. Fell in love. I'm going to send you a picture of Goose and Rose yeah. holding Mike. Okay, we'll we'll put it in the show notes for the for the audience. So listen, Perfect. thank you, thank you for making time. Uh, thank you for. I want to say thank you for all of the children that have benefited from all your hard, passionate work. And just, thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. Listen, we'll do it again. Right soon. back to you, Tracy. Thank right. you. And one more thing. You gotta, you gotta let me know that new book. I tell you, I'm gonna do I it. am. What's, what's the title? It's, you, can you share the title? The, the working title is the invitation, and it's about inviting people to play bigger. Thank you for asking, and uh, we'll unpack that when it when it's out in April. Okay, in April, I will, <laughs> I will, I will be first in line to pick that book up. Uh, the invitation, think there. I love it. I would, I would love, love, love for that when that book comes out. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Brad.